Let's look at Isaiah chapter 29 through 31. Uh, then we'll be about halfway through the book of Isaiah, which is pretty cool. So I'm glad that we're getting, getting there. And I think it, it will get uh, a little more exciting as we get to the second part of Isaiah and we start looking at uh, the return of Jesus Christ and what's going to take place um, at that time. So in Isaiah chapter 29, um, we see a spiritual blindness that, that comes upon Jerusalem. Now, it, it, it's not a physical blindness as we would think, you know, not being able to see uh, your neighbor, your family, your house, and which would be very difficult to live. But it's a spiritual blindness, and, and it's almost worse than a physical blindness. You know, at least with the physical blindness, your heart could still be right, but with spiritual blindness, your heart is wrong. Um, and spiritual blindness is a blindness towards the things of God. And even the motive of your heart can be deceived by the thoughts of your mind or by what you think is right or what you think is wrong. And we need to understand that that spiritual blindness will blind us from the truth because it's not about what we think. It's not about what we want to do. It's about what the Lord thinks, what He has written in His Word, and that we believe it and we apply it to our lives. Otherwise, you are spiritual blind. Um, there are people that are totally blind. I mean, they are just outright uh, blind to the spirituality of God, the Word of God, uh, pastors and churches that that proclaim to be Christians, but yet they don't believe in the Word of God. Uh, they don't believe this is the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, and so they pick and choose, whether it's prosperity, whether it's spiritualism, or, or what. They don't take it in context. They don't believe it from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, they don't accept certain doctrines and so forth. And I tell you what, if it was me, if there are books in here that have errors and there's some stuff that's not right, I would just throw the book away and I'd walk off this pulpit and start living my own life. Because then there's really nothing to trust in. Because who's to say that that, that part is good or that part is bad? Either we believe the whole thing or we don't believe the whole thing. And I hope that you've been challenged with that by the Spirit of God. I hope you've, in your own mind have come to the conclusion that this is the Word of God. Every little word, every little dot is important to God. He has written it down for us to learn and to grow thereby. And so I hope that you have decided in your own heart that this is the Word of God. Though there are things that are difficult to understand, and there are a lot of things that it's difficult to understand. You know, the grace of God is hard to understand. The judgment of God is hard to understand. Why do some people get judged and some people do not get judged? And there's some people that I like to see get judged, you know? And you're just wondering, why aren't they judged yet? And, and yet, there's some people that, that have just this grace poured upon them. Why are they having grace poured upon them? You know, great grace, their churches are grooming and growing, and yet, you know, their hearts were wrong. Their hearts were deceived. And yet, God still had such a great grace on them. I don't understand those type of things at times. You know, especially when you have smaller churches, you know, that are doing... Uh, just as much, you know, and yet the Lord decides to keep it small, you know, and, and do a different type of work. Um, but it's His work and not our work, and we don't put our faith and trust in what we think. It's what God says and what He has written in His Word, and so we believe those things. And so there's a spiritual blindness. There's also different degrees of blindness, right? I mean, we can understand certain truths, but then there are things that we're not blind, that we are blind to. You know, little things uh, in our own hearts, uh, preferences, you know, prejudices that we may have, you know, towards others and, and so forth. So we need to be careful and we need to be open to the Spirit of God uh, to reveal truth to us. So let's look at the uh, spiritual blindness of Jerusalem here. Uh, the Lord is going to humble Jerusalem because of their pride. And, and pride is an area that we can be blinded to. I know I'm blinded to it in many cases where pride wells up. You know, how many times, um, you know, I think we're all this way. We like to be noticed. You know, we want people to like us. And so when we're in a group of people, we, sometimes we talk louder. You know, or we'll go up and we'll shake hands with someone important so that others see, hey, this, he knows him? He's like, wow. You know, and it kind of puffs you up a little bit. It makes you kind of known because you're associated with somebody famous. You know, and it's like, well, I didn't know you knew him. Well, yeah, I, I do know him. You know, we go way back, you know, and that type of thing. You know? And so that's a, a sense of pride. And I find myself doing that sometimes, too, whenever I go out uh, to pastors' uh, meetings and things like that, you know, and, and I go stand with a certain person and so forth, and it's like, why am I doing this? And so I kind of like 
purposely not do that. I purposely not go and, and, and talk because I don't want to uh, seem like, um, you know, I have some pride or anything. I'd rather be humble than, than err and have the wrong heart. So he says, woe to Ariel. Now, Ariel is the symbolic name for Jerusalem. Jerusalem has many names. Uh, uh, Zion is another name of Jerusalem. Uh, here it uses the word Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Add years to years, least feasts come around. Yet I will distress Ariel. There shall be heaviness and sorrow. And it shall be to me as Ariel. I will encamp against you all around. I will lay siege against you with a mount. And I will raise siege work against you. You shall be brought down. You shall speak out of the ground. Your speech shall be low. Out of the dust, your voice shall be like a mediums or like a mediums out of the ground. And your speech shall whisper out of dust. And so he's speaking here of the Assyrians coming in and again invading them and attacking them and destroying them. And there will be sorrow and distress at that time. You know what I find interesting in pride? is that you're puffed up. And the Bible says pride goes before what? A destruction. And so if you're a prideful person and you're not aware of it, then eventually you will stumble. You will stumble. You will fall. And God will show you that you're really not all that you thought you were. You don't have all the answers. I know that I don't have all the answers. And even to this day, it seems like the older I get, the less answers I really have. And so I find that I don't have all the answers. <clears throat> because you see men who have been in ministry for a long time, and you think they've had all the answers, and yet they had struggles. You know, and they're men. And you go, wow, why? You know, where was the Spirit? Where was God? Where was His grace? Where was all these things working? You know, and... And you go, I don't have the answers, Lord, I really don't. Why do some fall and why do others not? Uh, but for the grace of God, there go I. Uh, but know this for sure, that if we have pride, destruction will come. You know, we think we can get away with things, and we can't. Uh, God will uh, cause us to stumble and to fall. Uh, he will use instruments to bring destruction upon a haughty spirit, and then fall will come. And so that's where Israel is at at this moment. Moreover, the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones like shaft that pass away. Yes, it shall be in an instant and suddenly. So, uh, you know, surprise. Wow, where did that come from? You know, how did that happen? Well, it's been happening and you've been blinded to it. You know, it's just a matter of opening your eyes and seeing what's going on around you. You will be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with storms and tempests and the flame of devouring fire. Uh, I had posted something on Facebook the other day about the end coming and someone said, what's new? You know, what's new? Uh, the world doesn't think it's coming, but you know what? It's going to come like a thief in the night. That's what the Bible says, right? And we better be ready. I think the church is getting ready. Billy Graham just uh, wrote that the end is here. He's, he really feels that the Lord's coming back really soon. Everything is just pointing towards it. Uh, some are suggesting that the blood moon, and we'll talk about it in a minute, the blood moon may be the, one of the first signs of Joel. You know, that, that the end is here, and the rapture may be the next event that takes place. Now, See, we have a choice here, and this is where free will comes in. We can accept that, and we can believe that, and then we can walk right out that door and do nothing about it. How many of your parents and family and neighbors and friends and relatives that you talk to and you don't even tell them about the Lord? You know, do you really believe it? You know, Or are you just kind of keeping it to yourself? Okay, it's coming, I'm ready, but you know what, I'm going, I don't care about anyone else, but I'm going, well, that's not the Christ-like attitude that we should have. You know, we need to care about others too. And so it's coming, and it's coming with fire. We're going to talk about this um, this coming Sunday, the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, the triumphal entry. Jesus came in riding on a donkey, but there's a second part to that prophecy. He's coming again, isn't he? And this time he'll be riding on a horse. You know, so first part's been fulfilled. Second part, Act 2 is coming just down the road. And, and it's real. It is really real. And we need to wake up, church. 
Uh, the multitude of all, verse 7, the multitude of all the nations who fight against Ariel, even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when a hungry man dreams and looks and eats, but he awakes and his soul is still empty. As if he were a thirsty man who dreams and looks and he drinks and he awakes and indeed he is fainted. And his soul still craves. So the multitude of all the nations shall be who fight against Zion. So again, even though there's an attempt to destroy Israel, God still will not allow Israel to be destroyed. There's a lot, of, a lot of talk today about Iran you know, invading Israel, getting their nuclear plant, and just wiping them off the face of the earth, pushing them into the ocean. That's not going to happen, right? We know that. We know that because the Bible tells us that Israel will not perish. They, God has an everlasting covenant with them. And so that's not going to take place. Now we've seen the regathering of the children of Israel to their nation. And so God is going to keep them in, until the tribulation period. And in the tribulation period, great revival. Probably the greatest revival ever that has ever taken place in history will happen during the tribulation period with the Israel people. And then at the end, God will stop the tribulation, because man will be utterly destroyed if he doesn't. And then Israel will be bowing and kneeing before the Lord in praise and worship to their Messiah, Jesus Christ, ultimately. And so we know that um, Iran's attempt to destroy Israel is futile. It's not going to happen, and we know that. And it's kind of exciting to see from this perspective what's going on with Iran, with Russia, Russia making deals with Iran for gas uh, treaties, helping them build these things, and thinking that um, they may both try to attack. And they're going to try to attack, but yet we know that God will be victorious. It happened in the past with Israel here, and it's going to happen in the future too. Now, there is also a spiritual drunkenness of, of Jerusalem. Now, when he says spiritual drunkenness, uh, he's not talking again of that physical drunkenness of, of drinking alcohol and then, you know, you do stupid things. Uh, there is a spiritual drunkenness when you get involved with the world, you get involved with the culture, you get involved with the sins of the world, and, and you're doing stupid things because you're not being spiritual, you're not... Uh, really having that relationship with the Lord, you're more having the relationship with the world, the whore, and you're doing all kinds of uh, dumb things that are just really bringing destruction to yourself. And that's what drunkenness does, brings destruction to your own self. So he says in verse 9, pause and wonder, blind yourselves and be blind. Uh, they are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on, the, on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophet's. And he has covered your heads, namely the seers. Now there's an apathy here. You know, they're not seeking God anymore. I think that's where the United States is, and God is waking them up a little bit. Just within the past week, how many earthquakes have we had? That's amazing. And they just had that one in, off Chile, the coast, you know, what, almost nine point? And, and you see some of the devastation that took place over there, eight point something. You know, here in La Habra, we just had one, and then again in. in industry area I believe it was and then another one somewhere else and then I just heard that there was another one too so so it's this apathy though the church is like still asleep even though we oh earthquakes oh the end's coming and then we go back to what we're doing it's like it doesn't really get us excited doesn't really motivate us you know my mom when we were kids she's the way you know how she used to motivate us you grab me by the ear and like ah, okay go do it I'm gonna do it now mom I promise you know and that's the way she would motivate us to do things because we didn't want to do it we knew we had to do it. We knew it needed to get done. And we knew that it was our job to do it, but we didn't want to do it. And so until they finally, you know, pulled the ear and, and said, go do it. Uh, the absence or even the suppression of passion for God. Now, passion for God is not a Pentecostal smile, you know. Jumping up and down and hallelujah, praise the Lord, you know, all this type of stuff. That's not the passion for God. Neither is a conservative smile. We're serious. We believe in God. That's not what it's talking about. Having a passion for God, because some people are excited. You need to be more exciting, you know, so you can see the passion for God. You know, that's fake. 
Or, or you need to be more serious, you know, and stop joking around so much. I, I hear that of certain pastors who like to joke from the pulpit a lot. You know, Man, I wish they'd just teach the word, you know, and so forth. No, what is the passion of God? It's really walking on the path with the Lord. It's that relationship that you have with him. <clears throat> whether you're a bubbly person, whether you're a conservative person, whatever you are and whatever God has made you, you serve him in that capacity, in your own ability for his glory and do it with all of your might and strength and power. That's the passion that we should have, but people don't have that passion. They have other passions. Now, what is passion? Passions, passion is something that, that, that you feel uh, very deeply for and you want to get done. We all have different passions in this world. You know, uh, one could be exercise, one could be uh, woodworking, one could be, you know, uh, sports, and, you know, it could be anything. But what about the passion for the Lord? The passion for the Lord should come first above all of those things, right? Because Matthew tells us that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all this other stuff will be added to you. I'm all for the other stuff, but if you're not serving the Lord first, if he's not number one in your life, as the Bible says, you know, how can you serve two masters? You'll either love one or the other. You'll either love the world or you'll, you'll love mammon, you'll love money, or you will, you know, love the Lord. And people that love money, they're the ones that don't give to the Lord. They're the ones that are out there working seven days a week, and, and when there's an opportunity, they work again because they put the Lord second and they put their jobs first because that's the love of money. And I'm just being truthful here. Now, I know we need to provide for our families. You know, I know we need to put food on the table. But we need to realize that it's God who puts the food on the table, not us. And we think because we work another Sunday, oh, good, the Lord's provided. No, he hasn't. I think the enemy has provided. He just kept you away from the Lord and the work of the Lord. And we can get so busy with work. Uh, years ago... Uh, I did some refinancing, and there was a, a gal that uh, she knew the Lord, and I encouraged her to come out to the church and and uh, get plugged in, you know. And she's like, "Oh, I really want to, but I really, you know, we've got a goal, my husband and I, and we want to get, re we want to retire at a young age and be set. And so when that happens, that's when I'm going to start going to church again. But my mom goes to church, and you know, and, and she's involved, and so we just kind of, you know, live that way. And I'm like, okay, you know, I, I think you need to put the Lord first. And it was like working seven days a week and in early morning, late at nights, and the kids were always gone and put in, put in places and so forth. And then recently I just heard that she now has uh, breast cancer. Wake up call. You know, wake up call. Yeah. Wake up call. You know, thank God that God is so gracious enough to allow something like that to, to take place in a believer's life to say, hey, Where's your priorities? Where's your priorities? We need to have those priorities. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Now there's a spiritual illiteracy in Jerusalem. Look at verse 11. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. So here's a guy who can read, but he goes, but I can't read it because it's sealed, so I really really can't get into it. And the book is delivered, or it's like the one who's, the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, please read. And he says, I'm not literate. In other words, I, I can't read, so how can I read it? And really, there is no excuse. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to be studying the Word of God uh, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, someone was telling me that they're almost done with uh, Chuck's audio tapes. It's taken him almost less than six months to go through his, the whole Bible with Chuck. You know, I thought that was pretty neat. It almost encouraged me. I want to do that now. I want to go through all of those, uh, those CDs with Chuck, too, because sometimes he gets 10 chapters at a time, and you just go through it. But what an accomplishment. I remember when I went through the commentaries of J. Vernon McGee, you know, just starting in Genesis and reading the commentaries in those little books and getting through, you know, just getting in the Word, sticking with the Word, studying the Word. It's not just Wednesdays and Sundays. It's every day. Uh, being a part of the word. Right now, what I'm loving is the little book of Jude. The Lord laid on my heart to just read that little book every day. And so I've been reading that little book every single day. It has so much to relate to today's, uh, today's situation in, in, in America, you know, with these men who creep in and um, they pretty much take the grace of God and turn it into lasciviousness. 
you know, and they're in the church itself and so forth and uh, his encouragement to defend the faith and things like that. You know, get into the Word. There's no excuse. We should be in the Word of God. We should be listening to the radio and commentaries, studying the Word of God so that we know who God is. And now the Lord sends a spiritual blindness upon Jerusalem in verse 13. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by commandments of men. Interesting verse, because just this morning when we gathered together, we read about this in Matthew chapter 15 with the religious leaders, the Pharisees. Remember how Jesus said the same thing with them? You know, they profess to know me, but their hearts are far from me. You know, I thought about that this morning, and then when I read this over again this afternoon while I was preparing, I was thinking, here you have the leadership of Israel, and God is saying that their hearts were hard to them. They had the lip service, praise the Lord, hallelujah, give your tithes and offerings, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not into your understanding. You know, just they, they had the words, but their hearts were far from God. And then here we are hundreds of years later, and these religious leaders of Israel, Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, we know God. He's the, he's the God of our father Abraham. We know the scriptures, and yet Jesus says, you don't know nothing. You profess to know me, but your hearts are far from me. How important is the heart? It's so important to have a right heart before God, to love God. See, having the right heart doesn't mean that you're perfect in your walk with God, nor are you sinless, because David was not perfect, wasn't he? He was not. He sinned against the Lord, but yet his heart was a heart after God's own heart. And that's what he loved about David. David loved God in his heart. He loved him in his heart. He loved to please the Lord. And though yet he struggled with his flesh and his own desires, and he suffered for that, but his heart was in love with God. Where's your heart? Or is it just lip service? You know? Do we come and, and we say, oh, I did my classroom you know, teaching with the kids. So I'm okay for the week. That's not how it works. That doesn't make you okay. It's, it's the daily thing that you do with the Lord. It's that relationship that you have with him. You know, it's when you read something and all of a sudden the Lord just, just really touches your heart and teaches you something at that moment, you know, while you're driving down the road or, or, or while you're, you know, sitting down and eating and all of a sudden something comes to your mind like, oh, thank you, Lord. That was so insightful. That was beautiful. That's something that I need to really remember in my own life because it's so easy to, to lean back on religion, and it's so easy just to trust in your works and what you're doing and not trust in your relationship with the Lord. That relationship is more valuable to the Lord, completely more valuable to Him. Therefore, behold, I will, verse 14, will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of the prudent man shall be hidden. Well, to those who seek deep, to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us or who knows us? God sees everything, right? <laughs> oh boy, he sees everything that goes on. There's nothing he doesn't see. Uh, surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say to him who made it, he did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, he has no understanding? That's evolution, right? The atheist. Oh, God didn't make me. There is no God. Yeah, right. How can we say that? Oh, verse 17. It is not yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and a fruitful field be esteemed as a forest. In that day, now again, in that day, in the future, uh, when everything is done, the deaf shall hear the words of the book, the eyes of the blind shall see out of the obscurity of, and out of darkness. The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord. The poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel, for the terrible one is brought to nothing. The scornful one is consumed, and all who watch for iniquity are cut off. Who makes a man an offer by a word and... Lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate and turns aside 
the just by empty words. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, nor shall his face now grow pale. But when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will hallow my name and hallow the Holy One of Jacob and fear God of Israel. These also who err in spirit will come to understand and those who complain will learn doctrine. So in the end, understanding will will definitely increase and they'll know um, the work of God. Now we come to chapter 30. And the Lord pretty much uh, rebukes them here because of their trust in Egypt. Remember, Egypt is a type of the world. Um, when the children of Israel were in bondage to Egypt, it's a, it's a spiritual analogy of us being in bondage to the world. Uh, when they were enslaved to them, we were enslaved to the world. When, when God pulled them out, of, the, of Egypt, it's like him pulling us out of Egypt. I love what John Corson said. Uh, he said, it's so easy for God to pull us out of the world, to pull us out of Egypt. But it's so hard to pull Egypt out of us. Isn't that true? That's one thing that I look forward to. The day when I get to heaven and, and, and Egypt will finally be out of me. You know, And I don't have to deal with my flesh, my desires, my, my own flaws, and, and I will be perfect before the Lord. I can't wait for that day. Um, if I had a choice right now, and the Lord gave me that choice, I said, Reuben, if I could ask you to just let everything go and come up to be with me, would you do that? I, I would jump at that at a moment. I would jump that. No question. Boom, I'm out of here. There, there's nothing holding me here. That's how much I hate my sinful flesh. I don't like it. I despise it. And yet, at the same time, I cater to it. That's something I don't understand. You know, it's, it's an enigma to me how I can say I love God so much and yet I love myself so much. You know, I care about myself so much. You know, that, that I want to pamper myself, you know, and I, I get angry when someone says something about me or, or looks at me wrong and, you know, and it's just like, wow, how can I love God so much and yet love myself so much when I'm supposed to love myself less and love God more. It's a constant battle, constant before us. And that's what he's talking about here uh, in chapter 30. Woe to the rebellious children. And it is rebellion, guys. God calls it what it is. It's rebellion. When we, we, when we don't follow God's commandments, it's rebellion in our heart. It says the Lord who takes counsel, but not of me. And, those, or, or, and who devises plans but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. So here's the sin, is that their counsel doesn't come from God. Their counsel comes from Egypt. It comes from the world. Who walks to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadows of Egypt? So in other words, Israel turned to man for help instead of God. This was the demise of Israel. See, God wants to be God. He wants to be the one that you come to. He wants you to trust in Him. He wants you to get in His Word so that you know His heart and you know what you need to do. What do we do? We go to the world. We go to a friend that doesn't even know the Lord and say, what do you think? And we're asking them advice for our lives. That's sin. And God says, what are you doing? You're rebellious. You don't come and ask me for advice. You ask them for advice. And we, not just friends, but we'll go to a psychologist or we'll go to a counselor, you know, that doesn't even know the Lord. Or we'll even go to a Christian counselor, you know, and God is saying, what are you doing? Why don't you ask me? Why don't you get my advice and stop asking other people? He says, that's rebellion. We need to know what the Lord has said in his word and know what he has required of us. And what we need to do. And we need to stop asking the world. We, not, we need to not believe that they have the answers. The president doesn't have the answers. Our city doesn't have the answers. Police don't have the answers. No one has the answers. The Lord has the answers. And we need to humble ourselves before the Lord. This is a principle that still holds true today. <clears throat> so many turn to man's philosophies instead of turning to God's word. And so God says, you're rebellious. And you don't come and you don't ask of my counsel. Therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame. 
and trust in the shadows of Egypt shall be your humiliation. <clears throat> I, I mentioned Christian counselors. Christian counselors. Christian who have counseling outside of biblical references. Run from them. <laughs> Because it will be to your shame. You go, you have marital problems, and so you go to someone and they're telling you, oh no, you should do this and you should do that. And you know that's not what Scripture says. Run from them because it's going to be your shame. You know, it, it will be to your destruction. You need to follow what the Word of God says. You know, believe in what Jesus has already given to us. Take His advice over anyone else's advice. That's what uh, God is saying here. Because the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame. In this world, for the prince were were at Zion, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of the people who could not benefit them, or be helped, or benefit, but a shame, and also a reproach. <clears throat> Verse six says, um, "As they trust in the world or in Egypt, it really doesn't gain them much." You leave God out of the equation. You know, If God's not in the equation, there is no power, there's no answer, there's really no strength. God has to always be in the equation. The burden against the beast of the south. The land of trouble and anguish from which came the lioness and lion, the viper, fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people who shall not profit for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose therefore I have called her Rahabhim Shemath go or now go write it before them on tablets and note it on scrolls that it may be for a time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people lying children children who will not hear the law of the Lord who say to the seer do not see and to the prophets do not prophesy to us righteous things speak to us smooth things Proph prophesy deceits you know it's those people that are saying we don't want to go to churches that teach the word of God we want to go to a church that, that that itches our ear that tells us good things that tells us we're good people that tells us that we're wonderful and we're okay and we're going to get to heaven and and all of that stuff they don't want to hear the judgment of God they don't want to hear that they're sinners they don't want to hear how to live good lives they don't want to hear how we ought to love one another and take care of one another and carry each other's burdens they don't want to hear that they want to hear that Others can carry their burdens, you know, and so that's what they're saying here. You know, we don't want to hear the prophets. Just give us smooth things, nice things to talk about. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the, uh, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. And that's what they're saying. We don't want God. Get him out of the way. Get him out of the way. <coughs> Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. And he shall break it like the breaking of a potter's vessel, which is broken in pieces he shall not spare, so there shall not be found among it fragments, a shard a shard to take fire from the heath or to take water from the cistern. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning the rest you shall be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be your strength. So again, even though <laughs> um, they rebel against God, yet God here promises that they're going to return, that He's still going to have grace upon them and mercy. And you said, no, for we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee, and we will ride on swift horses, therefore those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand shall flee at the threat of one, at the threat of five you shall flee, till you are left as a pole on top of a mountain, and as a banner on a hill. Therefore the Lord will wait. God is patient. Even though we, we get rebellious, and even though we might be sinning, God is a very patient God. The fact that we're still here today in this world speaks of God's grace. <clears throat> um, I don't know if you saw the post on Facebook about the, the um, abortion thing. Uh, they, they took uh, little BBs 
and to give you a comparison of the difference, they took all the wars ever done, and they filled this jar up about three quarters of the way with BBs. And that's all the deaths, 1,000 deaths per BB. Then they took all the abortions, and there were like 10 jars completely filled up. Of course, we saw that Sunday, 1 billion 303 aborted babies. Compared to all the wars in the world, it was nothing compared to the abortions. That alone, as a father, you know, a grandfather, I would be very upset, you know, if people, my children, my ancestors were aborting my grandchildren. I, I would do something. And here God is still graciously waiting I don't know what his expression is, you know, a billion, if he's just kind of shaking his head or, you know, or he's just kind of turning his back. I, I don't know what it is. You know, the Bible doesn't say, but he's waiting graciously. It's all grace because we deserve to be judged. We definitely do as a nation, as a world, because of what we have done. I mean, this is the worst it's ever been in all of society, in all of the world ever, to kill that many infants with abortion throughout the world. It's horrific. And that's including the, not, the German war too. Nothing. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Now God will always be gracious to us. And when he hears that heart of repentance and we turn to him, he will come running for us. Whatever sin it is that you're in, whatever sin that you think you're hiding and you're getting away with it, it's only God's grace because He's waiting. He's waiting for you to repent. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into this corner anymore. But your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. And so, here are the teachers. Here are the prophets that are teaching the word of God. And yet their hearts are far from God. They don't want to hear it. No, we don't like that. Give us something nice. Give us something a little better. And then Jesus comes along and he teaches the truth. No, no, we don't want to hear that. That's not true. You know, the kingdom of God is not at hand. No, no, God, you're not the Messiah. And they don't want to hear it. And so they crucified him. You will also defile the covering of your images of silver and the ornaments of your molded images with gold. You will throw them away as unclean things. You will say to them, get away, the cleansing of the heart. Then he will give the rain for your seed with which you sow the ground and the bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful in the day your cattle will feed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and young donkeys that work the ground will eat curd foddles or foodles, foddlers, which has been uh, whittled with the shovel and fan. There will be on every high mountain and on every high hill rivers and streams of water in the days of great slaughter when the towers fall. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In, the, in that day, or in the day, that the Lord blinds up the bruised of His people and heals the stroke of the wounds. Now, He may be talking about a supernova here. Revelation sixteen eight through 9. Now we know <clears throat> that there will be blood moons that will come in the end times. Now it could be that maybe it's a reference to the four blood moons that are coming. And in this year we're going to see four of them in these next two years. Um, interesting how Joel says, I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Job, Joel 2, 30 and 31. The moon turned into blood. Now I'm hearing 
on both sides because you, ha- you have to be conservative here. Could it be the end? Yes. Could it not? Yes. We don't know. You know but it's interesting. And let's wait and see what the Lord does with it and what happens <clears throat> in what? Six days from now. And in fact, if you look up in the sky, you can see Mercury uh, east at the horizon there, and it kind of rises. It's kind of a reddish, bright star out there or planet, and you have to really look for it. They say you, sh- you should be able to see it, and as we get closer, we're going to see it even more because it's when the, the Earth, <clears throat> the Moon, and Mercury line up, and it's Mercury that turns it red, so they're in perfect alignment. <clears throat> Apparently, that's how they, <clears throat> at that point, is when they begin to judge uh, when to send a craft to Mercury because they... they they time it from that point. So if they want to send one there, they send it uh, at a certain time when it's not there. And so that by the time it gets there, the, the craft is there with Mercury. So it's kind of like they meet all of a sudden and boom, uh, they, they time it just perfect. Um, some are saying that we've had all these blood moons uh, in the past, uh, lunar eclipses and all those things we've all had. Yeah, and I agree we have, but maybe this is the one that God's going to use, right? It could be. And I think we just need to be reminded that God, you know, is still thinking about the end coming and we need to be ready. We need to always be ready because the end could be near. In fact, it's nearer than it was yesterday and 10 years ago, you know, 27 years ago when I got saved, it's nearer uh, than that. So we need to just think about these things. Um, It's interesting because um, the first three take place during the spring which is a picture of the first coming of Christ, his death and, and resurrection, uh, when those moons come these next two years. The fourth is going to be in Pentecost, and it takes place at the beginning of summer, which pictures the work that is still ongoing, God saving people uh, from every tribe and harvest. And the last three will take place in the fall. The fall is a picture, that feast, of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the rapture, return of Christ, and joy is called the Shekoth. That's when the second blood moon will happen. And I believe it's um, this coming, it's the 14th, or actually April 15th, but then it will be uh, October 8th, with this, with, which is Shakath, which is speaking Christian interpretation of the second coming of Jesus Christ, or the rapture. It's a picture of the rapture taking place. So that second one, uh, is that picture that, of that feast where God will take the church out of the world. So interesting. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger and his burden is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, his tongue like a devouring fire. Again, we get that picture of God's judgment. Um, it's coming. Uh, he's going to be angry. Uh, that's why his judgment, indignation, means that he is really upset. His breath is like an overflowing stream which reaches up to the neck to swift the nations, to sniff, sift the nations with the sieves of fertility. <clears throat> and there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy festival is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goes with a flute to come into the mountains of the Lord, the mighty one of Israel. And the Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard and show the distant the sense of his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire which scatters temps, tempests and hailstones. hailstones. For, though, for the, through the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be beaten down as he strikes with the rod. And in every place where the shaft of the punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him, it will be with uh, tambourines and harps and in battle of banishing, he will fight with it. For Topith, which is hell, was established of old, yes, for the king and is prepared. He has made it deep and large. Its pry or pie is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. So he's talking about the pit, hell, waiting for those kings. And now we come to chapter 31. We will get through this. he talks about Egypt again here. He says it twice. In fact, if you remember last week, he talked about Egypt. How important it is that we get out of the world. Paul said that in Corinthians. 
We're not to be a part of the world. If we love the world, the love of God is not in us. John tells us that. We need to get out of this world. We need to get our priorities straight. The Lord's coming back soon and we need to get out of Egypt. It's not about our jobs. It's not about our working. It's about serving God. And it's about being faithful to Him and taking the opportunities that we have now. <clears throat> so it's, it's folly, again, trusting in Egypt and the world. They don't have the answers for you. Your job is not your answer, guys. It's not your answer. God is. Jesus is your answer. He's the one that provides for you. You start depending on the world. You know, um, <clears throat> I hear this every so often uh, from people. Uh, as soon as I win the lottery, the church will be out of debt. You know? And I'm like, <laughs> okay. I says, as soon as you win the lottery, you'll be out of here. <laughs> you know, that's what's going to happen. You know, when you win a billion dollars or whatever it is, you know, because that's the case. I remember years ago there was a guy that uh, I knew, and he won. Uh, he was in the church active, and he won the lottery, and he won something like $100,000 or so. I can't remember quite, but it was way up there. And all of a sudden, when he won that, never saw him again. He just left, and he started enjoying the, the world. You know, if you won the lottery and you came to me and said, look, I won the lottery, so I want to give all this money, I said, keep it. I don't need the lottery's money. You know, God doesn't need the lottery's money. God will provide for us. Don't worry. He will be faithful. You know, That's putting your trust in mammon. That's putting your trust in a worldly system instead of putting your trust in God. Well, why can't God use that? Okay, and that's why we're in trouble. Because <laughs> we think like that. Because God doesn't want to use those systems. It's a man's system. It's gambling. You know, it, it's a system that's made up of chance and you're hoping to hit the big one. That, that's all, you know, that's all man-made stuff. It's not putting your trust in God. It's not working. It's not depending upon Him. And we need to get out of that stuff. So he says about Egypt again, verse 1, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord? And so it's, it's pretty clear there. You know, we're not seeking the Lord. First he's seeking the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. He promises you that. Yeah, but when is he going to do that? Just keep trusting in him. He promises that he'll do that. He promises to take care of you. Yet, he also is wise and will, be, will bring disaster and will not call back his words, but will rise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall, and he who helped will fall down, they will all perish together. Egypt, the world is just man. And when God comes and he speaks, it's done, it's over. He just speaks and they're over with, destroyed, judged. For thus says the Lord, he has spoken. As a lion roars and a young lion over his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him, he will not be afraid of their voice nor be disturbed by their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. Like birds flying about, so the Lord will, uh, will, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, He will also deliver it. Passing over, He will preserve it. Return to Him, against whom the children of Israel will deeply revolt. For in that day, every man shall throw away his idol of silver and gold, sin which uh, your own hand has made for yourselves. The Assyrians shall fall by the sword, not of man. And a sword not of mankind shall devour him, but he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall become forced labor. He shall cross over to the stronghold for fear, and his prince shall be afraid of the banner, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose fierceness is in Jerusalem. And he's talking about Second Kings 19 there, where God sends an angel and kills 185,000. With not one man having to lift their hands, God took care of them all. Read it. It's pretty good. And so if God takes care of them, how much more will he take care of you? Psalms 34 says he's, he's given angels to charge over you. Stop trusting in man's systems. Trust in the Lord. Let's finish up in chapter 32. <clears throat> it's talking about the coming king, Jesus Christ. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and prince will rule with justice. I can't wait for that day. 
when Jesus rules and reigns upon his throne. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest, a river of water in the dry place, as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. The eyes of those who see will not be dim, and the ears of those who hear will listen. Also the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stimmers, stimmers will be ready to speak plainly. So he's talking about physical restoration here. When finally we will be those new creatures in Christ Jesus, that metamorphosis takes place, the twinkling of an eye will put on our new bodies, there will be no more blindness, no more stammering, no more, you know, uh, we'll just speak plainly. We'll know all things as he knows all things, as John tells us. The foolish person will no longer be called generous, nor the miser uh, said to be bountiful, for the foolish person will speak foolishness and the heart will work iniquity. To practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord. To keep the hungry unsatisfied and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Also the schemes of the schemer are evil. He will devise wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words. Even when the needy speaks justice. So he's talking about those liberal theologies. You know, they're, gonna, they're going to be judged too. They don't take God's word seriously who water it down in a sense. But a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. There's something to be said about generosity. Blessed are, bless, blessed are those who what, give, right? Blessed are those who give. It's better to give than to receive. Now we believe that, we've read it, but we don't, we don't act on it. We don't act on it. We really don't act on that one. You know, we all believe it, but when it comes to tithing, you know, in ten percent, we're like, no, I can't do that. But then, how would I? How, how will I eat? How will I pay my bills? You know, uh, you know. Then I'll have to trust in Egypt. God doesn't want me to trust in Egypt, so I better not do that. Then, see, we don't believe it. We don't believe that God can take care of us. That He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. God blesses us with, with something and we're like, oh, let's not give 10% because that's too much. And I love that uh, saying that we read a couple of weeks ago that you know, if you want to give a certain portion, then God will give you that set, certain amount of portion. But if you give abundantly, then you will reap abundantly. He promises that. That's something that we need to look at. Raise up, rise up, you women, who are at ease, hear my voice. You complaint, complacent daughters, give ear to my speech in the year, and some say, in, in some and some days will be troubled. You complain, complacent women, for the vintage will fail, uh, the gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease, be troubled. You complacent ones, strip yourselves, make yourselves bare, uh, and gird sackcloth on your your waist. He's giving you a picture here of of Israel with women. Uh, women oftentimes in scriptures portray the moral condition of, of men. So if the, the woman is, is giving birth and having multiples of children, then you're prospering and you're being fruitful. But if she's not, then it's, it, it's a defiled nation. You know, it, it's just speaking of Israel's state. And he's talking about the women here. People will or shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and berries. Yes, on all the happy homes in the joyous cities because the places will be forsaken. The bursting cities will be deserted. The forts and towers will become lairs forever. A joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. So blessings are brought by the Spirit of God then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace and the effects of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Again, there's the example of living a good life. Righteous living guarantees a quietness and, and assurance that God will be your provider and take care of you when you do the right things. My people will dwell in the peaceful habitation in sure dwellings, in quiet resting place, though hail comes down on the forest and the city is brought low in humiliation, blessed are you who sow besides all waters, who sent out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey. So <clears throat> we see the prosperity of those who trust in the Lord. 
when, when we put him first, when we seek the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and he promises to take care of us. And, and if he feeds all the birds of the air, how much more will he take care of us? How much more will he take care of us? He has done that for us time and time again. It always amazes me how we forget that. I know that he's done that for you. There's been times where God has been faithful and he has taken care of you and in times where you're going, Lord, I really need your help right now. And he does. And then we forget when he begins to prosper us that that's who he is. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so he, he will continue to take care of us. He promises that of us. Because he's faithful. And if we just continue to seek him, you know, in our prayer, in our reading, in our service to him, and just uh, glorify him, and, and not seek Egypt, not seek outside counseling, just seek truth and, and honesty and, and a willing heart to be servants with one another, God promises that he'll take care of it. You know, he promises that. And so we can hold him to his word.